for Paul, without whom there would be no Mr. O'Lantern. The media talked the night before Halloween about how the pumpkin man had saved the city the previous Halloween. Families carved jack-o'-lanterns and put capes on them, and they were all over the city. Everyone had a false idea about who this person was, but he couldn't correct them without stepping out into the spotlight again. The last thing he wanted was attention. I suppose you're probably wondering how I know so much about him. To tell you that, I have to go back a few weeks. I was sitting in a bar with a couple of my friends. They had helped me get through my wife's disappearance, and I probably wouldn't have survived without them. It had been almost two years since she had disappeared. She had been declared dead, but I couldn't accept that. Unless a body was found, I had to assume she was still alive. Happy birthday to Becky, I said to nobody in particular. I hope soon she'll make a safe return home. I raised my glass. Eddie and Gary raised their glasses as well, but they both stared down at the floor as they did so. They knew that September had been a rough month for me. Happy birthday, Becky, Gary repeated. Then there was an uncomfortable silence. I appreciate everything that you both have done for me, I told them. I, I know I haven't been easy to be around the last couple of years. Tell us when you're sober, Eddie said and grinned. It doesn't mean anything when you're intoxicated. Intoxicated? Gary questioned. You're intoxicated too, Edman. Gary then looked at me and said, Listen, Jack, I don't think it's a coincidence that the pumpkin man showed up right after your wife disappeared. I think he's connected somehow. Gary, I tried to sound serious, but there was a laugh in my voice. No conspiracy theories tonight. You got it, boss. The next morning, I woke up with an awful headache. I stumbled out of my bed and hobbled my way to the bathroom, where I opened up the medicine cabinet. I pulled out a bottle of Tylenol and swallowed four pills with water from the sink. As I put the bottle back in the cabinet, I knocked down a makeup kit that belonged to Becky. I had refused to remove any of her things from the house, because I wanted everything to be ready when she came home. The kit busted on the floor, and I saw a crumbled piece of paper that didn't look like it belonged. My head throbbed as I bent down to pick up the paper. Vince Predius was written on the paper. I stared at it for a long time. Who was Vince Predius? Why did Becky have his name written down and hidden in a makeup kit? Could he have had something to do with her disappearance? I stuck the paper in my pocket and hobbled back to the closet. I threw on a t-shirt and a pair of jeans, then stumbled toward the kitchen and put on a pot of coffee. My laptop was on the kitchen counter. I opened it and googled the name Vince Predius. Only one result came up, and it was a teenager in Oregon. That was a dead end, as Becky wouldn't have any way of being connected to a teenager in Oregon. Where had that name come from? I poured myself a cup of coffee and started to drink it. The Tylenol had started to kick in, and my head wasn't throbbing quite so bad. Part of the previous night's conversation started to come back to me, and I worried about something Gary had said. It wasn't the first time Gary had suggested that the pumpkin man had done something to Becky. I knew that was impossible. I would never do anything like that to my beautiful wife. The pumpkin man had only been seen publicly once, but the whole city remembered it. They all talked about whether the pumpkin man would come back this Halloween. They thought I was a hero. I wasn't. I was just a man desperately trying to find his wife. It was shortly before the pumpkin man's first appearance that I remember having odd abilities for the first time. I don't remember how I got them, but I remember displaying them for everyone Halloween night. 
The most significant of my abilities was being able to communicate with spirits of those who had passed from this life. I had never been able to communicate with Becky, which was another reason I had to believe she was still alive. As I finished my cup of coffee, I grabbed my keys from a hook by the front door and walked out to my car. The weather was a little colder than I expected it to be, but I didn't go back for a jacket. I got in the car and drove as quickly as I could to the police station. When I pulled up, the man I was looking for was walking out the front door. I yelled at him as I got out of my car. Detective Hall, I shouted. He turned, saw me running toward him, and I said, I have new information about Becky. I have a name, Vince Predius. He was involved in Becky's disappearance. Who is he? Detective Hall asked. He took the paper I was offering him and read the name on it. I, I don't know, I told him. That's Becky's handwriting. I found it in some of her stuff. This could be anything, he said, but I'll look into it. It must be important, I insisted. Please get right on it. Hall told me he would do what he could, and then went on his way. He had never made Becky a priority, which means I would have to take the investigation into my own hands. I could feel my skin getting hot, so I hurried back to my car. I didn't want Detective Hall to see what was happening. A yellow glow was already coming off my skin when I closed my car door, but I ignored it and drove home. When I got home, I opened a laptop that had been on the coffee table in the living room for almost two years. Becky had used that computer every day in the last several months before she disappeared. I hadn't been able to bring myself to open it until that day. It wasn't password protected, and the desktop screen popped right up. I clicked on the Internet Explorer icon. It took almost 15 seconds for a window to open and load, after which I was looking at a Yahoo home screen. I clicked on the email tab, and a pop-up appeared on the screen that said, Hi, Becky. Under that message was a place to put in a password. I didn't know her email password, but I wasn't ready to give up. I clicked on the link that said, Forgot Your Password. It gave me a chance to enter a phone number to receive a link to change the password. I entered my own phone number. The text came in almost instantly. On my phone, I clicked on the link I had received in the message, and it prompted me to enter and re-enter a new password. I did, and I was taken to a login successful page. I then entered the new password on the computer, and it took me to Becky's email. I clicked on the text box labeled Search Messages and typed in the name I had found. One conversation came up, and I clicked on it. I know Jack 14. I found a name, Vince Predius. I think he's the one. Chocolate Rose 12. Have you met him? I know Jack 14. Not in person. Meeting today. Chocolate Rose 12. Good luck. I know Jack 14. Thanks. I couldn't believe what I was reading. My wife had been having an affair when she disappeared. Vince Predius must have done something to her. Maybe she didn't tell him she was married, and he killed her when he found out. That scenario ran through my mind, but I forced myself to believe she was alive. There still wasn't a body. I still loved her, even if she had an affair. I still had to make sure she was safe. I picked up my phone again and dialed the number. The man I was calling was a computer genius and would probably be able to dig up information I wasn't able to find. He answered on the third ring. Jack, what's up? He sounded unusually cheerful. That wasn't like him. I need a favor, Mike, I told him. You name it, man, he assured me. I am here to serve. What you need? I'm going to give you a name, I said. I want you to find out everything you can. He would have lived close to here two years ago, and his name is Vince Predius. What else? That's all I have, Mike. I knew it was insufficient. That ain't much to go on, Jack, he told me. But I got you. I'll let you know when I have more information. 
Thank you so much, I said, and hung up the phone. At the soonest, it would be a few hours before he had any leads, which left me to dwell on the fact that Becky was having an affair. I could feel my skin getting hot again, as it did when I was angry or frustrated, and a yellow glow started coming off of it. I didn't resist it this time, but instead just let it happen. My hair faded slowly to orange, and I ran to my bedroom to grab my pumpkin man clothes. I had vowed that the pumpkin man wouldn't make another public appearance after last year, but I now knew the police wouldn't do any good in this investigation. It was time for the pumpkin man to investigate. Along with the change in my appearance, my other abilities began displaying themselves. I needed to get in contact with someone I knew had passed, someone I hadn't talked to in a long time. Once I was in my pumpkin man suit, I closed my eyes and focused on reaching the afterlife. I began to hear the sounds of thousands of voices overlapping, and it took several seconds before a bespectacled woman's face appeared and said, Welcome to Mortem House. My name is Susan. What can I do for you? Susan, I said. It's Jack Geist. You haven't found anything out about Becky Geist, have you? I haven't seen you in some time, Mr. Geist, she said, and her tone lightened. I haven't seen any record of Becky Geist, but we've had so many new people recently. The paperwork is all a cluster right now. Well, I'm actually here to speak with someone else, I told her. Can you get Harold Geist for me? Father, she questioned. I nodded, and she said, I can find him. Just a moment. Her face disappeared, and the noise of the crowd took over again. Since these people were in the lobby, most of them had died that day. It was a crazy world. I glanced around the lobby looking for Becky, although I didn't really expect to see her there. If she was dead, she had probably died some time before. Susan hadn't ever been able to find a file on her, and she was very organized in her file keeping. Becky was still alive. Several minutes passed before another face appeared in front of me. My father looked genuinely surprised when he said, They told me I had a visitor. I didn't have to say anything because he recognized me immediately and said, Jack, what are you doing here? Tell me you're not... I'm not dead, I told him. I'm just visiting, and I don't have time to explain right now. I miss you, Dad. Especially now. And I need some advice. A boy never stops needing his dad. What can I do for you? Becky has been missing for a couple of years, I told him. This morning, I found out she was having an affair at the time of her disappearance. I, I don't know what to do, Dad. I need your help. I don't know where else to turn. Are you sure she was having an affair? He asked me. I know times like this can be stressful, and I don't want you to jump to conclusions and do something you'll regret. I found an email conversation where she was telling a friend she was meeting a man for the first time, and she thought he was the one, I said. Dad, what if she got involved with somebody who did something to her? Why would she do that? Make sure you have all the facts right, Jack. My dad's voice was calm. There are two sides to every story, and you need all the details before you draw any conclusions. I haven't lived up to your name, I told him, tears in my eyes. The hell you haven't, he said forcefully. Jack, you have grown into a smart, kind man, and I know you're going to do the right thing. I'm so proud of you, son. I hate it that I'm not still there for you, but I will never stop loving you. I love you, Dad, I told him. I, What are you wearing? he interrupted. It's part of that long story I don't have time for right now. Before either of us could say anything else, Susan's face appeared again and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Geist, that's all of your visit time for today. Thank you for finding him, I said, tears now rolling down my face. 
please let me know if you find out anything about Becky. I opened my eyes and I was back in my bedroom. Crying had caused my vision to become blurry, but I could see that the glow was fading from my skin. I walked out the front door and began floating into the air. Flying was the ability that it took the longest to get used to. It's scary being that far up in the air with nothing between you and the ground. I flew over the city, knowing that as I did, people were pointing and taking pictures from the ground. They would be excited because they were seeing the pumpkin man again. I didn't care anymore. Everything I had ever known had collapsed, and I had to find some sort of shelter from the information I had just discovered. I flew to the lake where I had taken Becky on our first date. I had known that night that I wanted to marry her. I landed at the spot where I had kissed her for the first time. I stared out at my reflection in the water. My slicked back hair was orange. My shirt was orange with black sleeves, and a pumpkin face was on the front of it. A maroon cape blew in the wind behind me. For better or worse, I was the pumpkin man now. As I stood beside the lake, mental video of my first date with Becky played in my mind. I saw every last detail, just as it had happened that night all those years ago. Where was she now? Had she ever really loved me? With every day that passed, it seemed less likely that I would ever have answers to those questions. My phone rang, and I pulled it from my pocket. Mike's number showed up on the caller ID. I didn't expect him to get back to me so fast. I hit the green phone button and said, What's up, Mike? Got some info on you, Mr. Predius, he informed me. I think you better come out here and look at it, though, bro. I don't want to go over all this on the phone, if that's cool. I'm on my way, I told him, and I hung up the phone. I jumped into the air from where I was standing by the lake and flew to Mike's house. I was there in a few minutes, but realized I couldn't knock on Mike's door as the pumpkin man. I flew back to my house to grab some different clothes, threw them in a bag, and flew back to Mike's. I went into his storage shed in the backyard to change clothes, then went back around and knocked on his front door. How'd you get here so quick, dude? He asked when he opened the front door. Never mind, better just come on in. We got a lot to talk about. He motioned for me to come in, and I did. I sat down on the couch, and he said, Vince Pretius is dead. Has been for about ten years. I did find out that before he died, he owned a house on the edge of town. His family sold it to a man named Hank Tillman right after he died. Can you find out anything about Hank Tillman? I asked. He looked at me like he was disappointed. I got you, man, he said. Hank Tillman is still living in that house. He's unemployed, but seems to be independently wealthy. Spends a lot of money despite not bringing anything in. I can't, however, find any record of Hank Tillman before he moved into the Predius house. I'm going to pay Mr. Tillman a visit, I said, mostly to myself. I don't think you should do that, man, he told me. Could be dangerous. You ought to tell the police what you know and let them do their job. The police are not doing their job, I informed him. They've given up on Becky. I've got to find her by myself. I've got to know if she's still alive, what happened to her, and if Hank Tillman is somehow responsible. Becky went looking for Vince Predius, and I need to know why. Thank you for everything, Mike. I'll let you know when I know something. You better, Jack, he told me. You better. I decided to wait until the next morning to visit the Tillman house. I tried to collect all my thoughts so I could think with a clear head about what to ask him. The next morning I woke up in much better shape. I went outside and looked up to the sky. It looked like it was going to rain. I wanted to get to the Tillman house before the rain started, so I hurried. 
Mike had texted me an address, and I started flying in that direction. I landed about a quarter mile from the house so as not to attract attention from the house. I wanted my visit to be a surprise. I walked toward the house, and in my pumpkin man suit, attracted the attention of everyone on the street. They all pointed out the pumpkin man as he walked by. I didn't care about them, because they weren't in the house. As I approached the house, I saw a man standing on the porch. He had a thin mustache, and his eyes were wide. He was staring at me. So much for the element of surprise. I kept walking toward the porch. As I got close and started climbing the steps, he said, Mr. O'Lantern, I've been expecting you. His voice was slow and s precise. Each syllable was emphasized. I'm looking for information on the disappearance of Becky Geist, I told him. He grinned, and his eyes got even wider. His glare was very off-putting. Neither of us said anything for some time. I finally broke the silence by saying, Do you know who Becky Geist is? Come inside, Mr. O'Lantern, he invited me. I'm happy to assist any way I can. I was hesitant, but I needed any information he had, so I followed him into the house. The walls seemed to be freshly painted, and the carpet was new, but the furniture was all old and torn up. A stone gargoyle in the corner clashed with everything else in the room. The man with the creepy eyes motioned for me to sit down on a moth-eaten couch, and I did. "'Are you Hank Tillman?' I asked him. "'Yes,' he replied. "'And no.' I waited for an explanation, but instead I got more awkward silence. After several minutes, he finally said, "'For the last decade I have used the name Hank Tillman.' My real name, my given name, is Vince Pretius. But you already knew that, didn't you, Mr. O'Lantern? I suspected, I confirmed. You slept with my wife, didn't you? He shook his head, and his eyes widened again. I know she was going to meet you before she disappeared. I don't think I have anything more to say. Vince announced. Boys, seeming to come from nowhere, four men in dark masks were surrounding me and pinned me to the floor. I tried to fight back, but there was too many of them. I managed to pull one off of his feet as another one of them pulled a knife out and stabbed me in the side. I screamed, but was aware of Vince saying, Be careful, we're saving this one for Halloween. Sorry, Mr. Pretius. A deep voice answered from under one of the masks. Everything was spinning, and my vision was getting blurry. We'll get him down to the cage. I felt myself being lifted off the ground, and I had become too weak to fight it. They carried me for some time downstairs, and then I heard a lock unlocking. Stay back, I heard the same deep voice say. Was he talking to me? There wasn't much I could have done. They laid me down on what seemed to be a cot, and then they all left. I heard the lock click back into place. You're bleeding, I heard a female voice say. Are you all right? That was the last thing I heard before I blacked out. I woke up, but I didn't open my eyes. I vaguely remembered being stabbed and taken prisoner, but I told myself it was just a dream. When I opened my eyes, I would be back in my own bed with an empty bottle of booze next to me. The shooting pains in my gut said differently. He's awake, I heard a male voice say. I opened my eyes to see that I was in some kind of giant cage. There were several other people in the cage. One of them was a petite woman in jeans and a t-shirt. A large man in a suit sat in one corner, and the man who must have announced my waking up was sitting next to me, wearing pajamas and a ball cap. 
How is your wound? the woman asked, turning her attention to me. It was only then that I noticed the man sitting next to me was holding pressure on my side. The woman came closer, and I flinched. Don't worry, Mr. O'Lantern, is it? I believe that's what I heard him call you. We're all prisoners, just like you. The only people that will hurt you are the ones outside the cage. Ernie, you can let go now. The bleeding surely is stopped by now, and I want to look at the wound. Ernie took his hand away, and it was holding a bloody tie. My finely honed instincts told me it was probably the tie that was missing from the large man's suit. He still had not said anything, or even looked at the rest of us. As the woman approached me, I tried to sit up. It was too painful. Just relax, she said. I'm going to take a look at your wound. I'm Naomi Lincoln, R.N. I looked at the wound when you got here, and the main thing I was concerned about was stopping the bleeding. I want to get a better look at it now. I didn't resist as she lifted my shirt, which was also stained with blood. She stared at my wound for what seemed like an eternity, and finally said, You'll be okay. You need to take it easy for a while, though. I imagine moving is painful right now. They put a nurse in here? I asked when I was ready to speak again. Not on purpose, she said. I was chosen at random, just like everyone else. We don't know what they do with their victims, but they take one every so often. They don't seem to have a type. Ernie works in a grocery store, and Dave is an insurance agent. At the mention of his name, Dave still didn't look up. I wasn't chosen at random, I said. I came here, to the house. I didn't know what was going on, I just thought that Vince Predius might know something about the disappearance of Becky Geist. Even if Vince Predius knew anything, he wouldn't say anything, Dave finally spoke. If she was here, she probably won't be heard from again. If somebody had ever escaped from here, the police would have raided this place a long time ago. We need to figure out how to open the cage, I said. If there's any chance Becky was here, I need to find out everything I can about this place. Just calm down, Mr. O'Lantern, Naomi told me. You're not in any shape to go exploring right now. Besides, they won't have made it that easy just to open the cage. They can't take that chance, because it would destroy their operation here if someone did. We can't just give in, I insisted, forcing myself to sit up through the pain. We have to at least try. Maybe you're right, maybe we can't get out. But before we die, I have to know we did everything to try to get out. My skin was beginning to give off a glow, and the others backed away from me. You're that pumpkin man that was on the news last year, Ernie said. A lot of people thought you died. Why did you just disappear? I never wanted to become publicly known, I said. I did what I had to do to stop something that I was responsible for releasing. I had to do that. I didn't want people to know who I was. People don't need me because I have nothing else to offer. You give people hope, Ernie told me, and people always need that. Haven't you seen all the people that are putting out pumpkins with capes this year? That's for you, pumpkin man. Of course people need you. The glow on my skin started to fade away, and he moved closer to put a hand on my shoulder. You can do great things, pumpkin man. The world needs more people who do great things. So what do we do now? I asked. What kind of lock is on the cage? I urge you to let us do everything physical for now, Naomi told me. You're hurt, and you're not going to get better if you keep moving around. My pain was, in fact, getting worse, so I laid back down as she suggested. The lock is over there on the wall? And it's computerized, Ernie said. It's password protected, so it would be impractical to try to get it open, even if we could reach it. Our best hope for escape is the next time they bring a prisoner in. Usually, 
only two guards bring in prisoners. If we're coordinated, we might be able to overpower them. How often do they bring prisoners in? I asked. This time, it was Naomi who answered me. It depends, she said, but they usually don't bring a new one in until they take one out. Based on the pattern they've established, they'll probably be taking one of us out pretty soon. However, there's usually only three of us in here at a time. Predius said they were saving me for Halloween, I told them. I don't know what that means, but since I wandered in on my own, that may be why they put an extra prisoner in here. Look at that, Dave said. He pointed up, but still didn't move from his spot. We all looked up, but we couldn't see what he was talking about. There's nothing up there but the top of the cage, Ernie said. That's what I'm talking about, Dave confirmed. Look at the third bar from the back. That one, in particular, has so much rust on the ends, I bet it would come right off without too much force. That's not going to help, Naomi said. The bar probably will come off. But it wouldn't leave a gap big enough for any of us to get through. Not even me. That's not exactly what I have in mind, Dave told us. The next morning, we heard footsteps coming toward the cage. We all sat quietly on our cots, and I had the bar we had pulled loose from the top of the cage. We were anticipating that whoever was coming would take one of us to wherever they took people they pulled from the cage. The footsteps drew nearer until they were right outside the doorway. Finally, the door opened, but what I saw walk inside was not even close to what I was expecting. "'What the hell is that?' I exclaimed, staring at what appeared to be a five-and-a-half-foot-tall infant. It was wearing nothing but a diaper, and it carried a bag that appeared to have bloodstains on it. Naomi, Dave, and Ernie all looked it over at me, and I asked, Have you seen this thing before? Never, said Naomi. I don't even know what to make of it. Baby wants to play, the thing said in a sing-song voice. It started walking toward the cage. I raised the bar I had intended to stab one of the guards with and aimed it at the creature that stood right outside the cage. It crouched in terror and yelled, Don't hurt baby! Baby just wants to play! I hesitated as my cellmates yelled for me to stab the thing. It looked like something straight out of a horror movie, but its behavior told me it couldn't possibly be dangerous. I lowered the bar, but I didn't let it go. Protests to my actions continued to come from the other prisoners. In a voice that was more calm than I was, I asked the creature, What's your name? My name is Baby, the thing said. It stared at me as if it didn't understand the question. Will you play with Baby? We've got to find a way out of here, I told Baby, trying to keep my voice from shaking. What are you doing, pumpkin man? Ernie hissed at me. This thing is not to be trusted. It was in the house. Just relax, I whispered to Ernie. I don't think it's dangerous. Turning back to Baby, I said, Do you know how to open the cage, Baby? Of course, Baby said. If you want to play with Baby, you'll have to come out of the cage. As if he seemed to notice for the first time, he pointed at my chest and said, you have a pumpkin on your shirt. That's funny. Baby, I want to play with you tonight, I said, and it was becoming easier to keep my voice steady. He couldn't be dangerous because despite his abnormally large body, he acted like a toddler as well as looked like one. I want to play hide and seek, but we have to wait until everyone else goes to bed. I'll come back when the grown-ups are asleep, pump Mr. Pumpkin baby told me and skipped away the four of us that were still in the room all looked around at one another waiting for one of us to say what we were all thinking finally one of us did what the hell was that dave asked we all sat in silence for a long time 
Ernie buried his face in his hands, and Naomi just stared in stunned silence. I was too confused to process what had just happened. Dave continued, I've never seen anything like that, but whatever it is, it isn't natural. A few minutes later, the guard we had been expecting walked through the door. He put his hands on the cage, grinned, and said, Breakfast for three of you. One of you is coming with me. Who's coming with me? We all looked at each other, and I knew that none of the other three would volunteer. I made it my goal to make sure they got out of the house alive. I'll go, I said, standing back up. Not you, O Lantern, the guard told me. It's not your time yet. How about the big one? He pointed at Dave and said, You, come with me. Dave didn't move, just sat on the side of his bunk. The guard opened the door and said, Maybe you didn't hear me, big boy. He opened the cage and struck Dave in the back of the head with a gun. The other three of us got up to jump the guard, and he turned the gun on us. You three better stay put if you want to live a little longer. We all sat back down, and he turned the gun back to Dave. Dave's head was gushing blood, and Naomi was hesitant to sit back down, clearly wanting to try to treat the wound. The guard said, you'd better come with me, or I'll kill you right here. He hit Dave in the face this time, and Dave reluctantly got up to follow the guard from the cage. I felt powerless to do anything. I just watched as they both left, the gun now held to Dave's head. Damn it, I yelled as the guard locked the cage back. He left with Dave, and I turned to the other two prisoners and said, When Baby comes back to let us out of the cage, you two need to stay here. You'll be safest here, and I'll look for Dave. No way, Naomi interrupted. We can't let you endanger yourself while we sit here and do nothing. You have to, I told her. Look, you two have the most to live for. I don't have anything left. If I have to risk my life for you two to have a chance of getting out alive, I'm happy to do it. I will find out what's going on here, and I will do everything in my power to stop it. I don't like this, pumpkin man, Ernie told me. I know, I said, putting a hand on his shoulder. But it's for the best. You're the one who told me I give people hope. Let me do that for you. Trust me, Ernie. He nodded, and I said, I'll try to get back and let you know what I've found out. If it's at all possible, I'll have Dave with me. If he's still alive. He'll still be alive, Naomi said. He has to be. The day seemed to go on forever, and it passed mostly in silence. There was nothing anyone could say that would make what was going to happen tonight any easier for anyone. Finally, we heard Baby's footsteps approaching the door. He opened the door and said, You ready to play hide-and-seek with Baby? I nodded solemnly. You hide first, Baby said, and Baby will look for you. I was hoping he would let me hide first. Baby walked over to the cage and pulled a small device from his blood-stained bag. He held it up to the lock on the cage, and the cage door sprung open. You don't need the passcode? I asked. Baby doesn't know the passcode, he said. Baby has a clicker Baby can unlock the cage with. I'll just go hide then, I said, and started toward the cage door. I looked around one last time at Naomi and Ernie, and they both looked really uneasy. I tried to reassure them everything would be okay, but it was difficult because I didn't believe it myself. I told Baby to give me thirty seconds, and then I walked from the cage. I looked around when I got outside the main door to the cage room and started walking down the hallway. The hallway seemed to go on for a long time, and finally led back to the living room with the torn-up furniture and the stone gargoyle. Another hallway led another direction, and I started walking down that one. About ten feet into the hallway, I opened the first door on the left. It was a bathroom. When I opened the door, I almost vomited. 
The walls, the toilet, the sink, and the shower curtain were all covered with blood. The mirror was cracked, and the smell of rotting flesh filled the air. I slowly pulled back the shower curtain to reveal the bloody corpse of a young girl in the bathtub. At this, I did vomit all over the floor. I had to get out of this house, and I had to get Naomi and Ernie out, too. I had to try to get Dave. There was fresh blood on the inside of the doorknob, and I had to fight the urge to vomit again when I touched it. I made myself pull the doorknob open, and I eased back toward the living room. I approached the front door and tried to turn the knob. It wouldn't turn, but there was no lock on it. I looked over to see that there was another computerized lock next to the main door. I wouldn't be able to get out without help from Baby. I walked back down the hallway and past the bathroom. As I got further from the living room, the light faded to almost complete darkness. I could barely see it all when I opened the second door in the hallway, which led me into a room full of torn-up dolls. Arms and legs and heads were scattered across the room. As I realized that the dolls weren't really dolls, I heard Baby's voice approaching. Pumpkin Man can be my new dolly, he said. In that instant, I realized the others had been right. Whatever was going on here, Baby was in on it, and I was about to die. I opened the door to the closet and was able to conceal myself just as he opened the door to the room. I backed up against the back wall, which was covered in hanging clothes that couldn't possibly belong to Baby. As I leaned back, I fell backwards into what seemed to be a secret tunnel. Did you go through the closet, pumpkin man? Baby taunted, still getting closer. I jumped up as fast as I could and tried to take off running. Baby was still talking to me. Baby's coming for you. Baby's gonna get you. I continued running until I tripped over something and fell. Just as I reached the end of the tunnel, I looked up to see that I was now in some kind of den. A couch was along one wall, and a table sat along another. The table and the wall around it were covered in blood. There was so much blood in this house. I made it about halfway through the room before I thought I heard someone or something moving above me. I looked up, but I didn't see anything. On the other side of that room, a doorway led back to the living room. I ran from the living room back toward the cage. I had to try to get the others out of here. As I ran, I kicked something across the floor. I looked down to see that it was Baby's clicker. I picked it up as quickly as I could and kept running. When I made it back to the cage room, I had no idea how far behind me Baby was. I jumped into the cage and closed the door. I was confident I could open it again because I had the clicker now. When I turned away from the door, Naomi threw her arms around me in a tight embrace. "'We thought you were going to be killed,' she said. "'You weren't wrong,' I told her. "'It turns out that if Pretius doesn't kill us, Baby will.' I told her and Ernie about everything I had seen. I told them about the bloody bathroom and the corpse in the bathtub. I told them about the torn-up body parts scattered across one of the rooms. Lastly, I told them about how the front door had a computerized lock on it and that I had acquired Baby's clicker and should be able to open it. "'What do we do about Dave?' Ernie asked. He was staring at his feet because he knew the answer before he asked the question. "'There may not be anything we can do,' I said. "'He's probably already dead. "'As much as I hate this, we have to focus on getting ourselves out now. "'We can come back with police and hopefully figure out if Becky was here. "'We'll identify as many victims as we can. "'That's all we can do at this point.' "'There was silence for a long time. "'Do we go now?' Naomi finally asked. I had been waiting for that question, and I was ready with the answer. There's no reason not to, I held up the clicker. The other two rallied around the door and waited for me to hold the clicker up to the computer lock. When I did, the cage popped open and we stepped outside. We need to be careful because we don't know where Baby is. By now, Pretius or any of his guards could also be awake. Do not wander from the group. If we stay together, I think we can make it to the front door. 
When we get there, I'll unlock it with the clicker. You've seen more of this house than we have, Ernie said. Lead the way. I peeked outside the door of the cage room and didn't see anyone coming. I motioned for the other two to follow and stepped through the doorway. We sneaked through the hall toward the living room, looking for eyes the whole time. The only ones we saw were on the stone gargoyle in the corner of the living room. That gargoyle creeps me out, Naomi informed us. We walked toward the door, and I held the clicker toward the computerized lock. When I pressed the button this time, though, nothing happened. What's the problem? Ernie asked. He stared frantically at the clicker and at the door. It's not unlocking this one, I said, as though that wasn't obvious to all three of us. It must be programmed for that one lock. I don't know what to do now. Let's decide together. Do we go back to the cage and work on a new plan, or look for another way out now? We can't go back to the cage, Naomi said. They want to kill us, and we know that. If we go back to the cage, we are allowing them more time to do that. They'll kill us now if they catch us out of the cage, Ernie pointed out. I think that's a chance we have to take, I said. There's a lot of this house we haven't seen yet, and we need to check it out. Maybe there's another place we can get out from. I pointed down a hallway I hadn't been down and said, let's try this way. Naomi and Ernie followed me down the new hallway, and we opened the first door we came to. Behind the door was a glow that rendered me temporarily blind. As my vision came back into focus, I looked around to see that every wall in the room was covered in television screens. A pale girl stared into the screens with wide eyes, moving around the room to see each and every screen. They've got the whole place covered, Ernie said, looking at the screens. The pale girl didn't even seem to notice that we were in the room, and she didn't react at all when Ernie spoke. I looked into the screens, and the first thing I noticed was the cage room where we had been kept. But then I realized every room in the house was being watched from several different angles. I cautiously looked at the pale girl, and then turned to Naomi and Ernie. We should be able to use this room as a map. I told them. If we can figure out what we're looking for before we go out into the open again, it will help us tremendously. It'll give us a better chance of getting where we need to go without getting caught. What about her? Ernie whispered. He pointed to the pale girl, and he looked almost terrified. She appears to be too wrapped up in the security feeds to notice us, Naomi said. She looked at me for confirmation. I agree, I confirmed. It's possible that it's an act, as she prepares to strike. I say that because, as forced as she is on the screens, she would have known when we left the cage. However, I think that if she does start to strike, we should try to fight her. This is worth the risk, because all this surveillance could be a priceless tool as we try to escape. Ernie hesitated, but finally nodded. We started looking at the screens and assessing possible ways out of the house. I saw what must be the kitchen, and it was covered in blood just as the bathroom had been. I checked to see if anything in the kitchen could be used as a way out. As I scanned the kitchen, something became clear that I probably should have figured out sooner. I found Dave, Naomi yelled. He's alive! I found Dave, and he's alive! Keep your voice down, I hissed at Naomi. I believe that TV girl over here is completely hypnotized by these screens, but I don't want to wake anyone in the rest of the house. We have to go to the kitchen right now, and then you can tell me where Dave is. Why do we have to go to the kitchen? Ernie asked. I may have found something as well. There's a room where they may be keeping personal belongings from people who have been killed here. We have to go to the kitchen right now, I said to the pair of them. Everything else can wait. They're here, the pale girl called out, in a voice that sounded too loud for her small body. The prisoners have escaped. They're in surveillance. Come get them. Damn it, I exclaimed. Footsteps started becoming audible as the pale girl kept yelling. We've got to run. Follow me. I ran from the 
room and two guards were coming from the direction we had come from. I ran in the other direction with Ernie and Naomi following me. The guards were gaining on us and I yelled for Naomi and Ernie to go on. I slowed down to use myself as bait for the other two to escape. They didn't. "'We're not going to sacrifice you, pumpkin man,' Ernie called as he and Naomi turned around to join me. My skin began to glow, and I tried to hover into the air. As I did, one of the guards grabbed my cape and was pulled into the air with me. I couldn't maintain the hover with my cape choking me, and we both crashed to the ground. Meanwhile, Naomi and Ernie were struggling with the other guard. As we crashed to the ground, I tried to kick my guard in the face.' He grabbed my foot and twisted it. I felt the bone crack and pain shot through my leg. A gunshot rang in my ears, and I looked around to see where it came from. As I did, another shot was fired from the gun that was now in Ernie's hands. Both guards were dead. I tried to stand, but it was almost impossible with the throbbing pain in my ankle. Naomi knelt down beside me and started inspecting my foot. My whole body cringed in pain as she forced my shoe off of my foot. "'We don't have much time here,' I said, when I was able to speak in a calm tone again. "'There will be more on the way. If you two are able to keep running, I should be able to fly. We can't stop here.' "'Once we get somewhere we can stop for a bit, I've got to take a closer look at that foot,' Naomi said. Ernie tucked the gun he had acquired into his pocket and approached us. Naomi said, "'If you feel like we need to get to the kitchen, we need to do that quickly. Then we've got to get to Dave.' I managed to get into the air, and my foot throbbed. I flew slowly toward the kitchen, and the other two trailed behind me. As we arrived in the kitchen, what I was afraid of was quickly confirmed. A pan on the stove sat on a burner, holding several fingers.' I opened the freezer to find several full arms and legs, and at least nine heads were thrown into a box in the corner. A corpse on the counter had been cut open, and most of the organs had been removed. Everything was covered in blood. "'They're cannibals,' Ernie whispered. He was the only one who spoke for a while. We all looked around the room, trying to take in what we were looking at. Naomi vomited when she saw the severed heads, and it was all I could do to suppress my urge to vomit yet again. Footsteps approached, and Ernie said, "'We gotta get out of here. Let's get back to the cage.' At that point, I finally agreed that we needed to get go back to the cage. We needed to plan better before we could decide what to do next. I flew toward the door, and my broken foot hit a stack of pots and pans, knocking it to the ground. I screamed, and the falling cookware caused a series of loud crashes. "'Someone is in my kitchen!' we heard a gravelly voice yell, and the footsteps became more rapid. Adrenaline took over my body when I fell to the floor, and the pain in my foot temporarily vanished as I got up and started running with the other two. We didn't actually see anyone else before we got back to the cage, and we jumped in and closed the door. As I collapsed onto my cot, the pain in my foot became unbearable. "'You should have stayed in the air,' Naomi told me, approaching to examine my foot. "'I didn't have time to think,' I told her, irritated that I was having to explain myself. I acted out of instinct. "'You may have to have surgery on that foot,' she said, as if she hadn't even heard me. "'At the very least, we've got to get you to a hospital. "'You need medical attention that I can't provide here under these conditions.' "'I don't care if I lose my damn foot,' I yelled at her. "'Right now, I'm much more concerned with staying alive. "'And the people that live here literally eat humans. "'You did notice that, right?' "'She backed away from me and threw her hands in the air. "'I'm only trying to help you, Mr. O'Lantern. "'Maybe you don't feel like you need help from mere mortals, "'but it doesn't look like you're doing so hot on your own.' "'Stop it, both of you.' Ernie interrupted. It was the first thing he had said since we got back to the cage. If any of us are going to have a chance to survive, we cannot argue amongst one another. We must work together to find a way out of here. Don't let a series of unfortunate events get the best of you. There was silence for several minutes. I'm sorry, I told Naomi. 
She reciprocated, and I said, I'm just really frustrated. I had an idea, and it's not going to work. Let's figure out what we do from here. Pumpkin Man, Ernie started. Then he paused. He finally said, The girl you're looking for, if she has been here, then something she had with her is probably in the room I saw on one of those televisions. Okay, I said. I'm going to look for something of Becky's. Naomi, I want you to find Dave and get him back to us. Ernie, see if you can find a way out. We'll leave when everyone goes to bed tomorrow night and meet back here an hour later to regroup. Sound like a plan? We'll give it a go, Naomi agreed. The next night, we all pretended to be asleep until the guards left us alone. My foot was wrapped as well as it could be with a bed sheet, and the other two were sporting bruises all over their bodies. We were ready to try our escape again. I pulled out the clicker and held it to the computer lock. The cage popped open, and we stepped outside. One hour, I confirmed. Don't forget. They both nodded, and we split up. Ernie had told me that the room he had seen looked like an attic, so I started looking for anything that might lead to an attic. The house was quieter than I expected. I thought there would be more guards on duty all night after the fiasco that had happened the night before. After ten minutes of hunting, I found a small door that led into a ceiling. I hovered a little higher until I could push it open and fly through. It was a huge attic, and most of what was in it was shoes and jewelry. A wedding dress hung on one wall, and it looked as though someone had died in it. I had to remind myself that it was likely someone had. I quickly began scanning the shoes, and it took me only a few minutes to find what I didn't want to find. My heart sank into my stomach, and dizziness overtook me as I saw Becky's shoes. They were pink tennis shoes with blue laces, and the initials B.G. had been etched onto their sides. Becky Geist. She had been here. She had been taken by the cannibals. I had to get to my wife. There was no reason now for me not to meet the same end she had. I hovered back to the floor outside the attic and glided toward the living room. I was going to find Vince Pretius and let him do whatever he wanted to do. Death meant nothing to me now that I knew my wife had been murdered. I heard voices as I approached the living room. When I turned the corner, I saw a group of people standing around the stone gargoyle. Vince Pretius was in the middle, surrounded by six guards, the pale girl from the surveillance room, a short man in a chef's hat, and baby. Naomi and Ernie were tied to one another and sitting in the floor in front of the group. "'Did you think I didn't know you were wandering the house at night, Mr. O'Lantern?' Vince's smooth voice hissed at me. "'Did you really think you could escape detection by my guards? Did you think you could escape them? They know all the shortcuts.' Let them go, I demanded with every bit of strength I had left. I'll take their place. Pretius laughed. Upon your arrival, he told me, I knew that you would try to play the hero. But there's not a damn thing you can do to save them. I saw Ernie shiver, and tears fell from Naomi's eyes. Fine, I said. I'm not worried about what happens now. Maybe a few days ago, I would have tried to play the hero. I don't have the strength for that now. Did you find something in my house that upset you? Did you eat my fucking wife? I yelled as loud as I could. All of the anger that had been building inside me erupted at that moment. Everyone in the room shook with surprise. As the sound of my voice escalated more than even I had expected, I waited for him to deny it. Instead, he remained calm. That made me even angrier. I couldn't say with any certainty, he said, his big eyes focused on me. I don't take time to become familiar with my dinner's personal life. The sound of sirens faded in from somewhere outside. For the first time, I saw a hint of panic on Pretius's face. He looked at the people around him, and they all nodded. 
The ten of them all grabbed onto the stone gargoyle just as the sound of feet made us aware that police were on the front porch. Save us, Spot, Baby said to the gargoyle. The gargoyle sprang to life and flew into the air. Just before it would have hit the ceiling, the gargoyle, along with everyone else touching it, disappeared into thin air. At the same time, the door gave way to the foot of a police officer, and seven of them came rushing in. "'What happened?' asked a plainclothes one at the front. I looked him up and down and debated whether or not I should answer. "'Are you finally going to take me seriously, Detective Hall?' I asked when I decided at last to speak. "'Mr. Geist?' he questioned. I nodded. gave statements to the police about how we had been kidnapped, tortured, and how the people in the house were cannibals. We told them about Dave, who was still missing after a search of the property. A statewide search started for Vince Predius and his crew, and I did a lot of thinking about what Becky would have wanted. That's why, after I received medical attention for my foot, I would be in a wheelchair for the foreseeable future. I decided it was time for the pumpkin man to tell his story to the world. He saved our lives. A year ago, news anchor Christina Wilson told the camera in front of her. Most recently, he found his own life in immediate danger. He's here now to tell us the story. The camera panned to include me in the shot, and Christina said, First of all, we've seen you, but you've never really made yourself known. So the city took to calling you pumpkin man. What is your name, though? That's a complicated question, I said. I've been called many names. Pumpkin Man, Captain Pumpkin, the Flying Orange. But to me, none of these really seem to fit. I believe our enemies shape us just as much as our loved ones, and so I felt like it was only appropriate to take on a name that was originally intended as a slur. I believe it shows strength and character... And those are two things I want to pass on to this city. Because just like all of you, I am strong. I am brave. My name? I am Mr. O'Lantern. From behind the camera, a faceless voice called, The feed has just been cut. We're not live. Somebody figure out what's going on. Two police officers entered the room and walked directly to me. That's very moving, one of the officers told me. I fell for every word. You're under arrest, Mr. O'Lantern. To be continued.